important message, folks. The death of the church. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verses 1 through 11. I have the passage on the screen in front of you if you need that to follow along. Paul the Apostle writes to the church at Corinth, Do we begin again to commend ourselves? Or need we, as some others, epistles of commendation to you or letters of commendation from you? Ye are our epistle, written in our hearts, known and read of all men. For as much as ye are ma uh, manifestly declared to be the epistle of Christ, ministered by us, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not in tables of stone, but in fleshly tables of the heart. And such trust have we through Christ to God word. Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything as of ourselves, but our sufficiency is of, Christ, of God who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament, not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth, but the Spirit giveth life. But if the ministration of death, written and engraven in stones, was glorious so that the children of Israel could not steadfastly behold the face of Moses for the glory of his countenance, which glory was to be done away, how shall not the ministration of the Spirit be rather glorious? For if the ministration of condemnation be glory, much more doth the ministration of righteousness exceed in glory. For even that which was made glorious had no glory in this respect by reason of the glory that excelleth. For if that which is done away was glorious, much more that which remaineth is glorious. I am fully aware that passage sounds very confusing <laughs> at a pass. And in a moment, I'm going to read it to you from the NIV to help you understand it a little more clearly. But if you'll bow your heads with me one more moment, King Jesus, once again, Lord. We come before the throne of God humbly, making ourselves available to you, Lord. It is my desire, God, since the day you called me to preach. At the age of eight years old, on the pew of that little Pentecostal church in southern New England. Lord, my desire has always been to serve as your mouthpiece, your oracle, not alone, but one among many around the world declaring, Thus saith the Lord. Master, today I desire that you would use me in a special way to speak a prophetic word to your church, a prophetic warning, to sound a warning in Zion, God. Lord, your church is dying, and it is dying of a wound that is self-inflicted. Master, in the name of Jesus, I pray, God, that the anointing of the Holy Ghost would rest upon me, that it would rest upon the hearer, that you would touch every ear, God, today. Let our heart this moment be conditioned by the Holy Ghost to receive that which you would declare unto your people. Speak to us, O oh God. Speak not to our head, but to our heart. Let our spirit today, God, be refreshed and renewed in your presence. And let our faith today, Lord, be multiplied. Let us leave the house of God able to declare, I have heard from the Lord, I have heard from the Lord. Grant it, Master, for we ask it 
In Jesus' wonderful name, amen. Praise God and amen. You may be seated this afternoon. Amen. I realize this passage, you know, I'm telling you, the King James, some of it might as well be Shakespeare. Because it just, you know, sounds like a bunch of jumbled words. And unless you really understand how to read Shakespeare, you know, you'll read some of that and not have a clue what in the world you just read. Well, I want to share this same passage with you from the NIV today. This might help you. And, of course, wouldn't you know I forgot to grab my, my sheet of paper so I, I don't have it printed out. And I don't have an NIV in the pulpit, but I'll read it from up here. Paul wrote, are we beginning to commend ourselves again? Or do we need, like some people, letters of recommendation to you or from you? You yourselves are our letter, written on our hearts, known and read by everyone. You, sh you show that you are a letter from Christ, the result of our ministry, written not with ink, but with the Spirit of the living God, not on tables of stone, but on tablets of human hearts. Such confidence we have through Christ before God. Not that we are competent in ourselves to claim anything for ourselves, but our competence comes from God. He has made us competent as ministers of a new covenant, not of the letter, but of the Spirit, for the letter kills, but the Spirit gives life. The greater glory of the new covenant. Now, if the ministry that brought death, which was engraved in letters on stone, came with glory so that the Israelites could not look stead, uh, steadily at the face of Moses because of its glory, transitory though it was, Will not the ministry of the Spirit be even more glorious if the ministry that brought condemnation was glorious? How much more glorious is the ministry that brings righteousness? For what was glorious has no glory now in comparison with the surpassing glory. And if what was trans transitory came with glory, how much greater is the glory of that which lasts? It's a little bit easier to understand that, I think. Amen. Praise God. The death of the church. We live in an era today... where it seems like every other day we're seeing something in the news about someone going into a school or going into a place of business or going somewhere where there's a gathering of people and taking many, many lives. Funny, many lives can be taken and yet, it, you know, you can lose 50 people, and there weren't 50 people shooting. There was only one shooting. You don't need 50 shooters to take out 50 victims, do you? No, one shooter is sufficient, and that shooter can take out many, many victims. We've all heard the old adage, you know, that guns don't kill, people kill. Well, there's, only, there's something a little bit wrong with that saying. It's real cute to say guns don't kill, people kill, uh, but that isn't true. Both kill. People kill. They don't need guns to kill. You can kill with a knife. You can push somebody out a 20th store window. 
You can throw somebody over a balcony. You can hit somebody with a car. There are many ways that people kill. But to say guns don't kill, people kill, is absurd. There are some children that start playing with daddy's gun and wind up blowing their brains out and that child had no intention whatsoever of hurting anyone, let alone themselves. And I tell them the truth. Amen. Was that child setting out to kill? Did that child employ that gun? No, that gun killed. Do you follow what I'm saying? Yeah. That gun did what that gun does. Whether or not the intent behind it was to kill or not, it doesn't matter. The gun killed because guns kill. Do you follow what I'm saying today? So the reality is, yes, guns do kill. Yes, people do kill. But you can't say one or the other. No, both statements are true. Guns kill, people kill. People sometimes use guns to kill. Sometimes they don't use guns to kill. But a gun is used for no other purpose but to kill. A gun is not destroyed, Martin, to bring life. If somebody's lying on the floor, Johnny, and they're struggling to breathe, and all of a sudden you see them give up their last breath, and their chest no longer compresses, and you notice that they're no longer breathing, and you listen, and their heart is no longer beating, who among us grabs a gun and shoots them in the chest in order to revive them and bring them back to life. Nobody does. Because a gun does not bring life. Amen. My goodness, am I telling the truth? You cannot make a gun, no matter how hard you want it to, you cannot make a gun bring anything to life. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. You can't make a gun restore anything. No, because a gun doesn't restore, a gun destroys. If you shoot something that is not living, you're going to destroy what you shoot. Am I telling the truth? Yeah. Sometimes people are trying to, the police are trying to get into a locked building and they shoot the lock or they shoot the handle of the door in order to do what? So the bullet can come out and magically turn it and, you know, play with it and and break in the lock and get you in the door. No, it's to destroy the lock. It's to destroy what it hits. Am I telling the truth? Mm -hmm. yeah. My Bible tells me that Satan cometh not, the thief cometh not, but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. Got news for you. Guns are used in those exact same ways, to steal and to kill and to destroy. If somebody wants what you've got, they don't necessarily have to fire the gun, uh, uh, Johnny. All they got to do is present it. Yeah. I lived in New York City for a number of years, and if somebody showed up and they stood behind me and pointed this at me and said, all right, put your hands up, you're not too likely to say, yeah, I think I'll just keep doing what I'm doing. I'll keep going where I'm going. I'm going to ignore you. You don't mean anything to me. No. All you have to do is see that little baby presented, and you're more likely to comply. The thief cometh not but for to steal and to kill and to destroy. This thing right here can help you accomplish all three of those things. can help you steal. can help you kill. It can help you destroy it by telling the truth. By the way, before y'all get too nervous, this is a air gun. I didn't want you to see that right away. It is also empty. This takes a special kind of ammunition. You actually have to load your pellet into these little bullet affairs, and then you stick the bullets in there. Before church, I emptied them all out. I would not even bring a loaded air gun into the church. But I wanted to use this as a demonstration tool today. I wanted to use this as a visual aid. And by the way, this thing feels real. Boy, I'll tell you what, you ought to fire it, it's fun. I don't have a problem with guns, so don't anybody think, 
then I'm up here preaching a message on gun control. That's not my job. My job is not to preach political issues. I don't have a problem with guns. I don't have a problem with people owning guns. I don't have a problem with people using guns. Tommy and I went to the gun range yesterday, and we were practicing with our weapons that we've purchased because we've got land in the country now, and there are bears up there, and there are wild pigs up there. And if you run into a bunch of wild pigs, trust me, you don't want to be going, shush, shush, go away, go away. Because, honey, they're going to maul you. They're going to get you. Wild pigs can be vicious. A lot of people don't realize wild pigs can be vicious. So I told Tommy, I said, we need to get us a couple of weapons that we can carry on us when we're out in the woods. And you guys know some of y'all have weapons as well. And I've told you, if you come out in the country, bring it. Don't put your... Don't put your ammunition in, you know, until you need it, but bring it. Because you might run into wild pigs. If you're going to the outhouse at night, you might run into a bear. If I run into a bear, I want something to protect myself. So I don't have a problem with guns, per se. I don't have a problem with responsible guns. Now, Tommy's going to get mad at me, but I have to tell you this. <laughs> I, I've owned air guns and stuff for many, many years. So I, I've used air guns, and, and I love them. So I've had a lot of practice aiming and firing, and you know. Booby's new to all this. If he ever gets mad at you and he points a gun at you, now notice I don't even have my hand on the trigger because if, if you're not ready to shoot, you don't put your hand on the trigger ever. Even in jest, even in play, you don't ever want to do that. Kids, if you're watching, watch what the preacher's telling you. You see how I'm holding this? All right? I said, if Tommy gets mad at you and he points his gun at you, don't worry. Don't worry. Just stand still. He may shoot 30 or 40 times, but as long as you stand still, you'll be okay. <laughs> I do a lot better, but we won't go there. Amen. <laughs> Paul writes to the church at Corinth about something that is as dangerous to the church and that is as fatal to the church as a weapon like this. Paul wrote to the church at Corinth in the third chapter, and he made it abundantly clear, we are not ministers of the law. We are not ministers of the law of Moses that God gave to Moses on Mount Sinai. We are ministers of the Spirit. You see, as a New Testament church, we don't preach rules and regulations and law and dogma. We preach liberty in and by the Holy Ghost through the work of Jesus Christ on the cross of Calvary. Because of what Jesus did on Calvary, we today have the opportunity to walk in fellowship with God and to experience God in a way that the Old Testament saints never had the opportunity. We have the opportunity because of the blood of Jesus Christ being shed on Calvary's hill. We have the opportunity today to be filled with the Holy Ghost and power. Hallelujah. We have the opportunity to receive the gift of God's Spirit in our body and in our lives. The message that we preach is not the Old Testament message of rules and regulations and laws and dogma. No. Our message is a spiritual message. Our message is about relationship. Our message is about an experience with God. It's a very different message. And yet, the Apostle Paul said, even though the Old Testament law 
was so flawed. You remember what I said last week? That what the law could not do, the law couldn't even do it. Couldn't even work. No matter how you slice it, it couldn't work. Even though the law was flawed and was incapable of accomplishing its apparent purpose, still when Moses came down from the mountain, from being in the front of God and having the tablets of stone upon which God himself had carved the Ten Commandments. Moses' face shone like a light and the people of God literally could not even look at him. They had to put a cloth over his head because his face glowed. They couldn't even look at him, Johnny. And Paul said, if the law which was flawed and incapable of accomplishing its apparent task could cause such great glory that Moses' face would shine like the sun so that the people of God couldn't even look at it. He said, how much more should the New Testament message of God be met with glory? Oh, I'm going to tell you. I was born and raised in Pentecost. I've been in this movement a long time. I've been in services where I have seen the glory of God come down in such powerful, glorious manifestation that as human beings, we could not stand in the presence of the Lord. I have been in services, literally, folks, where I have watched the power of God move through the sanctuary and people all over the building literally just began to fall under the power of God. They weren't up front, Bill, where some preacher was pushing them down. And, no, they were in their pew. And all of a sudden, the power of God began to flow. And people literally all over the sanctuary, Martin, just began to fall under the power of God. They couldn't even keep their legs underneath them. They couldn't even stand up under the glory of God. I've been in services where the power of God has moved so wonderfully through the people of God that I can't even begin to explain it. You would have to be there to know what I'm talking about. It's just amazing. The most wonderful thing. But you know what? The glory of God is hard to find in the Pentecostal church anymore. I don't care how many Pentecostal churches you visit. Your chances of seeing a service like I just described are one in a billion. Yeah, the Pentecostal church, you don't see... The Spirit of the Lord falling like the Spirit of the Lord used to fall. You don't see the Spirit of God moving like the Spirit of God used to move. You don't see the glory like you used to see the glory. And yet we've got preachers and people in the church who want to believe that the church is perfectly healthy and all is well and everything's going good. It is not. The church is dying. And I've got news for you, my friend. It is not dying because the enemy shot it. It is dying because it shot itself. Uh -huh. The word of the Lord tells us, the apostle Paul told us in 1 Corinthians chapter 3 and verse number 6. He said, who also hath made us able ministers of the New Testament. Not of the letter, but of the Spirit. For the letter killeth. Oh my goodness. For the letter killeth. The letter, listen to me now, the letter kills, but the Spirit makes alive. The church is dying today by a self-inflicted wound because it is preaching the letter of the law. And we've lost sight of the New Testament message Amen. of the Spirit of the living God having access to our life 
by the accomplished work of Christ on Calvary. And if we preach the wrong message, we are preaching death rather than life. Amen. Oh my goodness. I've been watching over the last many years, I've watched the evangelical and fundamentalist churches. I've watched the Assemblies of God, the Church of God. I've watched the United Pentecostal Church. I've watched all these denominations. As slowly, the Spirit of God has bled out. And more and more, you go to their church services, and you no longer see the glory of the Lord. You no longer see the power. Oh, when this movement started! My God, when this movement started... People would rush down to the altar to be saved, and the pastor never had to give an altar call. The pastor never had to invite them to come down and pray, but the Spirit of the Lord would move in the church service in such a wonderful and powerful way that in their heart... They were convicted of sin. In their heart, they knew, I need to make myself right with God. And they would, without a single word from the preacher, without a single invitation from the pastor, uh, Bill, they would rush down to the altar, and they would begin to pray and seek God. Now we got preachers, they got to get up in front of people, and they've got to try to fear monger. They've got to try to cajole you. They've got to try to manipulate you. They've got to try to use every psychological and every uh, uh, emotional tool they can use to motivate you to come down to that altar. Why? Because they're preaching the wrong message. Kills me today how many people are happy to go to a dead church. There are people that watch our videos, and you know what? They go to a dead church because, after all, my preacher preaches against sin. I remember my grandmother. That was her big thing. Oh, I'm telling you, I'd ask her. She'd say, oh, we had an evangelist today visiting our church. I said, really? And how was he? How did he preach? She said, well, he preached against sin. Hallelujah. And I'd say, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. What are you sorry for? He did what he's supposed to do. I said, really? He, that's what he's supposed to do is preach against sin? That's, that's what a preacher's job is. When you're in the church where the majority of people in the building are supposed to be born again, spirit-filled, tongue-talking, Jesus' name, baptized believers, your job is to preach against sin? Really? Is that what your job is? So uh, 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 let me ask you a question. Uh, when you come home to your ten children, Grandma, and you'd just been somewhere and you watched a bunch of kids acting up and misbehaving and plan acting the fool, do you come home to your ten children and read them the riot act and give them a big talking to and, you know, a chiding over behaving in that fashion. Well, no, because my kids aren't acting like that. That's my point exactly. My point exactly. I don't assume God's people aren't acting right. I assume God's people are doing everything in their power to act right, and what they need is all the encouragement and all the push and all the shove they can to keep working at it. Hello now. Amen. It's not my job to preach sin out of them. My job is to help push them in the right direction. The Word of God said Moses was a preacher of righteousness. It does not say Moses preached against sin. Well, what's the difference? Oh, there's a huge difference. If you had any concept of what different words in the Word of God mean, maybe you'd understand it better. Righteousness means to do right. Moses was a preacher of righteousness. What does that tell you? That means he instructed the listener on how to do right. He did not instruct the listener on what not to do wrong. Well, 
Pastor, I don't understand your message. I don't understand how you preach in your church. You don't get up like most Pentecostals do and preach against drunkenness and preach against whoremongering and preach against this and preach against that and preach against this. Um, no, I don't. Well, you must believe in those things. No, I don't. I don't do them either. <laughs> But what I do do is try to help people know the right way to go. I do try to help people make the right choices. I do try to help people make the right decisions. If I help you go the right way, guess what's going to happen? You ain't going to do the wrong thing. That's right. It's that simple. Yep. The more I help you to know the right way to go, the more I help you to understand you got to love the Lord with everything you've got. You've got to invest your time, your energy, your effort into your relationship with God. You've got to establish a walk with God. You've got to hold tight to your faith. If you'll do those things, Martin, I promise you, all the things you shouldn't do will be dropping off of you. All the places you shouldn't go, you'll just find yourself not going. All the things you used to say, you'll find yourself not saying. So an old song we used to sing said, Oh, there's a great change since I'm reborn. 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 Things I used to do, I don't do them anymore. Places I used to go, I don't go there anymore. Things I used to say, I don't say them anymore. There's a great change since I'm reborn. The problem is, instead of preaching people into a new birth experience, we're trying to get them to act like they've been born again in spite of the fact they haven't. I hope you heard what I just said. You're trying to preach people into doing things that they ought to be doing because a born-again person does these things, but if they're truly born again, they will be doing those things. If they're not born again, then, honey, I got news for you. You can preach for them to do those things all you want to, and you ain't going to change a thing. I grew up in a church where the preacher spent more time telling us what not to do than he spent telling us what to do. <laughs> there were kids in the church that I grew up in. John, uh, I knew people, Johnny, that, you know, young men slept with every girl that walked. I knew young girls spread their legs for every fella that come down the road. I knew kids that smoked pot. I knew kids that smoked cigarettes. I knew kids that did drugs. All of them, children of parents that were part of our church. They sat there every Sunday and listened to the preacher preach and were unmoved. Never changed their behavior. Never changed what they did or how they did it. They heard the preacher week after week after week. Um, there's an old saying, you keep doing the same thing the same way and getting the same results. Uh, you ain't very smart. You're not very smart. But we got preachers who are convinced that that's the way you're supposed to do it, even though it doesn't work. But while you're preaching at those five people out of a church of 300, how are the other 295 benefiting? While you're preaching against things that those five people out of 300 people are doing, what are you doing? What are you saying that's helping the other 295? Not a bloody thing. You haven't preached anything to help them come into closer communion with the Lord. You haven't preached anything to help them find a deeper, more intimate fellowship with God. You haven't said anything that benefits them. You're so worried about those few, and you're preaching at those few, and those few, Satan is just laughing at you. He just chuckling. Because all these centuries, Satan knew, I cannot destroy the church from without. If I destroy the church, I must destroy it from within. So what does he do? He's got preachers preaching the wrong message. And there's the life of the church slowly bleeding out on the ground. 
because the letter kills. It's the spirit that makes it alive. I got news for you. If you preach the right message, you'd be more likely to reach those five. If you'd preach the right message, you'd be more likely to reach those five. Instead of preaching condemnation and criticism, instead of preaching them into hell and trying to scare them into heaven, if you would let them know that God loves them, that he understands their loneliness, he understands their despair, whatever it is that motivates them to act the way they act, God understands them. He may not approve of their behavior. He may not approve of their conduct. He may be unhappy with the way they choose to live their lives. But he has never stopped loving them. For God so loved the world that he gave. His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but should have everlasting life. If you would preach that message of restoration, if you would preach that message of reconciliation, if you would preach that positive message of hope and help and healing and salvation, you'd be more likely to reach those. Oh, my goodness. Because, honey, you can preach the law all you want to. It'll never stop being death. Paul said the letter kills. He didn't say it has the potential to kill. He said that's all it does. The only thing you can accomplish with the letter is destruction. The only thing you can accomplish with the letter is death. The only thing you can accomplish with the letter of the law, my friend, is negativity and destruction and death and annihilation. That's the only thing you can accomplish with the letter. If you think preaching the letter is going to bring you any other result, you are sadly mistaken. The letter kills. Period. End of the story. That's all the letter can do. That's all the letter can do, Martin. It's not capable of accomplishing anything else. This weapon is not created to bring life. It's created to kill. It's created to destroy. That's it. That's all you can accomplish with this. Am I telling the truth? Next time you see somebody lying on the ground having had a heart attack, take a gun and shoot them in the head and see if they jump back to life. No. But we've got a church today and these people, they're not going to want to hear this old queer preacher because they're not going to, oh, I don't like him. I don't like what he has to say. I don't like who he is. I don't like what he does. I got news for you. If God can talk through a jackass, he can talk through this jackass. Don't think for a minute God can't talk through this boy, honey, because the minute you think you can ignore my message because you don't like who I am, you're a bigger fool than anybody. There are preachers on TV I can't stand. Preachers I see on television, I have no use for them whatsoever. But you know what, Johnny? Every once in a while I'll be flipping through the channel, and I'll happen to see them, and I'll happen to hear a sentence or two. And you know what? I know in my heart that that sentence or two, God meant it for me. I don't care whether I like them or don't like them. If God's trying to tell me something, I'll take it from wherever I can get it. Amen. Hello now. I'll take a word from the Lord from wherever I can get it. God can, if God can use a donkey to talk to Balaam, he can use a donkey to talk to you. See, that's the problem we got with people. I love people in the church saying, Well, bless God, I never go to church and live and I don't bring your brief. Why, he's full of sin and he's this and he's that. Uh, uh huh. Yeah, instead, you go to your church where your pastor is having an affair with the church secretary. The only difference is none of y'all know it. But you believe God speaks through him. You believe the Lord ministers through him. You believe the Holy Ghost is operating through him. I got news for you. He is, he does, and he is. Because it's not about the preacher. It's about the one being preached. God can use the most sinful person on the planet. Just because Jimmy Swaggart was out 
having his little tryst with hookers. You know what? It did not stop God from anointing him and helping him to reach tens of thousands of people. That's right. Because it's not about Jimmy Swagger. If God withdrew the anointing from every person on the planet who was less than perfect, every pulpit in America and around the world would be empty. My Lord, am I telling the truth? See, Amen. I'm the only preacher in the country that will tell you that. I'm the only one honest enough to tell you that. No, God uses the imperfect. I remember years ago, I, I do some things or say something and, and kind of make such a fool out of myself. And then I'd get in the pulpit. I'm talking many years ago uh, when I was evangelizing and stuff. And then I'd get in the pulpit and preach, and God would use me so powerfully and so wonderfully. And one time I said, Lord, I don't understand how you can use such an imperfect person like me. I don't understand how you can use somebody like me that is full of so much contradiction and, you know, so weak and so... And the Lord spoke to me clear as bell and said, well, it's easy. It ain't about you. It's about me. See, if you were preaching you, I wouldn't help you. But you're preaching me. I'm going to help you preach about me. You're preaching me. You're trying to point people to me. You're trying to help people find me. I don't care how imperfect you are. As long as you're trying to help people find me, I'm going to help you help people find me. You follow what I'm saying today? Amen. Oh, we got people in the world today, bless God, I mean, I would never go to a church with a queer preacher, my God, I wouldn't go to no church with a gay pastor. Why, there no way in the world. Let me tell you a little secret. Even if what I believe is flat wrong and I wind up splitting hell wide open, I can still help you make heaven. <clears throat> Paul said, he said, I work on myself to bring my body under subjection, lest having preached to others, I myself might become a castaway. He said, I work on myself because I can preach and help others and at the same time be lost myself. But it's funny how people, oh, they make up their mind, bless God. No, I wouldn't go. I, every time I listen to that fellow preach on the Internet, I mean I hear from heaven. Every time I hear that preacher preach on the Internet, I know God's spoken to me. But I'd never go to his church because of who he is. Okay. Sounds to me like a good way to shoot yourself in the foot, but, you know, <laughs> whatever floats your boat. If you'd rather go to a church where you can be convinced that old oh, brother so-and-so, why he's holy, he's righteous, he's godly. Um, everybody thought that about Jim Baker. Everybody thought that about Jimmy Swagger. Everybody thought that about old, what's his mug up there, uh, Ted Haggard. Oh, my God, he was the head of a whole evangelical fellowship. Everybody thought he was the cat's meow. Guess what, honey? He had sin in his life. My goodness. I want to tell you something today, folks. The Church of Jesus Christ, particularly the Pentecostal movement, is dying. It has been for many years. It's bleeding out in the streets. It's losing its lifeblood. And it is dying because of a self-inflicted wound. The enemy has convinced us to preach the wrong message. Do you know why there are millions of evangelicals in America today who are standing behind and supporting one of the most wicked, ungodly, demonic human beings who has ever, ever run for public office in this country? You know why? Because they are stuck on the message of the letter. That's why. And all the letter knows how to do, Martin, is destroy. No. All the letter knows how to do is kill. You cannot get a constructive end out of a destructive weapon. Yeah. Now, the only thing maybe you might get constructive out of a gun, I guess, if, if you put a big old block of cheese out there and shoot a bunch of holes in it, you can sell it as Swiss cheese. 
but that's about the only constructive thing I can think of. It's not designed to be constructive. It's not designed to build. It's not designed to help you accomplish positive things. No, it's designed to kill. Well, but bless God, it kills so I can eat. Yeah, but it still kills. That's its purpose. Now, what you do with that after you've killed it is yours. That, that's on you. But that weapon was designed to kill. The law kills. The letter of the law kills. It's the spirit that gives life. That's why the Pentecostal church for all these now over a century has been preaching the message of the Holy Ghost baptism. Because the spirit gives life. You can go into Pentecostal churches today and you won't even hear a message about the baptism of the Holy Ghost. They're too busy preaching about political events. They're too busy preaching about current events. They're too busy preaching about what's in the news and what's happening in the world today. They're too busy preaching the rules and regulations. People shouldn't be doing this. People shouldn't be doing that. Those queers, those drunkards, those prostitutes, those people, these drug users, those Mexicans, blah, 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 blah. And they're all hung up on the letter of the law. And what they don't realize is they're killing the church. They're killing the church. Would you stand with me today? Amen. That was a pretty concise message today. Some of y'all must be real happy. I did it without even predicting I would try to do it. See, if I'd have said I was going to try to keep it short, you know what? <laughs> I'd have preached forever. So maybe I just need to not say that and, and it'll work better. Amen. Did you hear from the Lord today? Yeah. Do you understand something? I'm going to tell you, I've had people in this church, members in this church, who would come to me and talk about things, and I could see they were slipping back into the law. I could see, uh-oh, they... And not on the LGBT issue, on other issues. And I'm saying to myself, no, no, don't go there. Don't go there. You don't want to play with one of these. Don't go there. The minute you go back there, this is what you're messing with. And this thing is designed to kill. Amen. Would you pray with me?